but on the screen to check in um, whether you're a student or a member or not. It just lets us know that you're here and you can earn points for attending our events. And if you are a member, you can redeem those points for swag, for um, sweatshirts, t-shirts, hats, Chick-fil-A gift cards, and more. So um, you can check your balance, browse our swag, and cash in your points anytime using our app. And if you're not a member already, we'll put that up at the end as well so you can do that. So welcome everyone to AFS today. My name is Neha, and I'm the Outreach Fellow here at the Entrepreneurship Center. I want to thank you all for joining us today. And I'm super excited to introduce you to our guests in just a few minutes. But first, I just want to give you a quick rundown of what today's format is going to be like. So I'm going to start by introducing our guest, and then we'll engage in a brief interview so that everyone can hear more about his story and get a sense of what his entrepreneurial journey has been like so far. And then we'll head into a Q&A where you'll all have the opportunity to introduce yourselves and ask any questions that you may have. So our questions for me will largely be based on our pillars of entrepreneurial thinking on the wall over here. Um, we use these as the central ideas for everything we do here at BBC, and we believe that they're essential in developing the skills and mindset of an entrepreneur. And we'll place them in the chat as well for those who are online to take a look. And with that being said, I'm really excited to introduce our guest today, Ross Perkins. Hey, how's it going, everyone? Yes. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Um, all right, so just a little bit about Ross. I'll give you a quick bio. So Ross graduated from William & Mary in 2007 with degrees in economics and government. And then he worked at the Peace Corps in Malawi as a business developer and an economic development analyst. After returning to the United States, he was a financial analyst for Booz Allen Hamilton and KPMG before becoming a content developer for Eater. In 2015, Ross joined Mason Dixie Foods a year after they were founded during their transition from a restaurant to a company that produces consumer packaged goods for over 5,000 retailers all over the country, including Wegmans, Kroger, Publix, and many more I'm sure you've heard of. As COO and co-owner, Ross manages the, company, the company's operations and analyzes data and financial information. So thank you so much for joining us today, Ross. How are you doing? I'm good, I'm good. It's actually uh, fantastically gorgeous today. So I was like, happy to make the trip and like come back to Williamsburg you know, for a hot minute. So yeah. Thank you so much. Um, let's get right into it. So starting from the beginning, growing up, what were some of your interests and how do you see them playing into the entrepreneurial side of yourself today? Um, well, I mean, as a kid, like one of the things I always like to do, I, I was always like into um, kind of doing my own thing. I was very independently minded. Um, and I knew like, you know, even from a young age that at some point I had to work for myself. I would never work harder for anyone than for myself. Um, so we'll go back to my story actually, because um, I, we talked about the fact that I worked at large consulting firms. I, um, worked in um, the, 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 the food content space with Peter. I was always like dabbling around trying to figure out what my passions were. Um, and I really, really honed in on what um, what really mattered when I was working in Malawi with the Peace Corps. So like you said, I graduated in 07. What was happening then? It was the, uh, the recession. Um, and that was a good time to actually really evaluate what my goals were. Because prior to um, going to the Peace Corps, I thought, you know, studied economics, studied government, let me go ahead and go into law school, like, you know, a lot of other, my, of, uh, you know, my fellow students. Um, but I'm glad that uh, I made the pivot, did a piece for, was working with small-scale entrepreneurs. Like, that's where I really found um, my passion, it was really, like, working with other people who wanted to chart their own path, wanted to work for themselves, and wanted to, like, develop their own enterprises. So, um, it even, you know, it's like, from just from the time I was a kid, I knew I will never work hard when I'm doing for myself. So, um, yeah. yeah. It's good that you found that passion early and really knew what you wanted to do if it wasn't a specific industry. Right, right. So how did your time at William and Mary help develop your personal and professional journey? Um, so, there was, I mean, there are several other things that came out of uh, my time here that really kind of helped me figure out what path I wanted to go down to. So the first and foremost was uh, the communication skills. Um, working in um, economics, studying uh, government, you know, I was at Morton all the time, 
one of the first things that like you know kept getting reiterated was you to communicate ideas to other people, whether it's uh, through uh, written communication, through verbal communication. Um, and uh, my network too from my class helped me kind of get my first foray into uh, professional life. Um, I was very fortunate to have some great professors in the uh, the economics department that really kind of helped guide me and help me kind of find my path. So, yeah. Is there anything you wish you took more advantage of while you're here? Excel. Like, um, that was actually, if, and even with my junior hire. So I kind of want to take a step back and explain a little bit more about my company. I think it will provide a little bit more context for everyone. So um, we do food manufacturing. We manufacture frozen baked goods on behalf of about 6,000 stores right now. Um, but we're also in the food service space. So I service um, a lot of Marriott brands um, on their Better For You Breakfast program. Um, I didn't think I'd be in food manufacturing. I didn't plan to be in food manufacturing. Food manufacturing is sexy, um, but the opportunity developed because I met my business partner, Asha Avalasha, um, back in 2014 when she was launching the concept. At the time, it was called Mason Dixie Casino. Started off as a restaurant concept in Washington, D.C., um, but we, um, when we were um, launching as a restaurant, we had this latent demand from consumers that kept asking for, it was biscuits. It was a very simple concept, biscuits and fried chicken. We kept having consumers asking for the biscuits in, to take home. You know, they're like, can we just take this home? We want to make this all ourselves. So from our, late, our actual demand in the restaurant was where the, uh, the consumer packaged goods uh, idea came about. There's a few other things that were kind of not in my bio because they're like little aberrations, but I had my own CPG company for a hot minute before uh, uh, Mason Dixie Foods. Um, it was a spice nut company, very small scale. Um, and I had about 30 stores I was servicing, um, but I, I closed that. Um, I had to shut it down and I guess it was in 2015 because I became allergic to my own products. Developed a tree nut and ground nut allergy. If there was ever a time when you need to figure out whether you should invest more resources in the business. If it's killing you, you need to take, you know, you need to get the hell out of there. Um, and so, uh, well, what's, isn't there one of the, is it failing wisely? Failing wisely. wisely. Failing wisely. So, um, yeah, when an allergist is telling you, like, you need to stop making your damn products, but I would consider that, like, under the failing wisely uh, pillar of entrepreneurial thinking. So, um, yeah, so, we now, you know, we service Marriott um, with some of their brands. This time last year, we had about a dozen and a half employees. Now we're at 36 uh, employees. Uh, we have about half, I'm based in Baltimore. So the, the company is based in Baltimore. We've got maybe half of the people are in the Baltimore area. The other half are completely remote. Um, you know, I have people working. Uh, we pull from Nestle, Del Monte, uh, Kellogg's, General Mills, like all the big CPG companies, you know, that's, that's where we're finding our talent. That's where we're finding um, um, our, 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 team, our team members to help us grow. Um, did I think I'd be in this position? No. Did I plan to be in this position? No. Do I have the skills to manage this growth and manage this team? Yes. I'm developing like in real time. You know, but um, I, I wanted to provide a little bit more context because like we are, we're past the startup phase, but we're not a mature company. We're like a teenage company. Um, we are still making mistakes. The mistakes are more expensive, and the mistakes are, you know, when, when we make them, they're it's 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 more problematic than when you're just like, you know, a little fledgling company. So um, I'm sorry, I like completely digress from, from that. Really, but yeah. I think context is really important. I, I think it is too, because it's like um, just, just uh, you know, about you know, 20 minutes before this discussion, um, you know, Marriott um, contacted us because they wanted to do another pilot program with one of their other brands um, within the, the Marriott band. Um, they want to launch at the end of the month, 425. You know, so I have to make sure my manufacturing partners across the country are aligned to do this in effectively less than 14. So in 11 days, we need to launch another trial um to 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 meet our customers expectations you know there's no playbook for that um but you know gotta gotta get the team aligned you gotta you know rally the troops and you know you gotta get it done so 
That's actually another one of our entrepreneurial pillars is improvisation. Yeah. Sounds like you're using a lot of them. Yeah, no, I, I, I was going through the list earlier and actually like, um, there's not one that I don't touch on every day, but there's definitely ones where I'm pretty weak on and I know that. So I think it's a good question to work on those, like the, the weakest of those, so yeah. Uh, we can actually get into that right now. If you oh, collaboration. The question is, what would you like to leverage more? Collaboration. Um, especially when you're, you are, you know, launching a business, and when, especially when you're starting those, like, you often can come across as a bull in China shop. You often have to be a bull in the China shop because, you know, time is of the essence. You want to be first to market. You want to capture market share. You know, you want to, you, you want to be the, the shiny object in the room, you know, especially if you're launching something that is completely, um, completely innovative. You don't have, you don't have wherewithal or the time to, to take a loss. So you push and you push and you push, but you know, it comes at cost. And oftentimes it is collaboration. And, uh, you know, like I said, now that we're moved beyond the startup into more teenage phase, I am taking more pauses. I am understanding, especially for um, our strategic partnerships that, you know, it is a collaborative enterprise. I can't be the bull in the China shop anymore. Um, my investors won't tolerate a bull in the China shop anymore. Like you have to be very cognizant about, um, you know, being collaborative in the space. But, you know, there, there are the times and place for that. So. Speaking of collaboration, um, you said you work with over 6,000 different retailers at this point? Yeah, yeah, each retailer. So like, you know, uh, Publix, you're talking about 1,200 stores. So like that's just one customer. So, um, but we do everything from like, you know, uh, Publix's, we did rotations at Sam's Club, we worked at Costco to, you know, um, a lot of little like mom and pop shops as well, which are, you know, smaller customers, obviously more high touch. Um, but we got Albert and Safeway, Kroger, same uh, oh, by Walmart. So, um, yeah. But our bread and butter is actually the food service side now. Not, we, and this change, again, this goes, I think, to uh, what's your improv 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 improvisation, probably. Um, if you talked to me six months ago, we were a business that focused on grocery with a little bit of food service. Well, we pivoted that uh, the revenue channel in food service sparks what we're doing in the grocery space. So now we are a food service company with a little bit of a grocery business at this point. So, yeah. yeah. Always adapting to whatever customer needs. Um, so were there any challenges that you didn't expect with working with a bunch of different retailers and, you know, having your ears in all these different um, types of industries? Um, well, Every time you deal with a retailer, so like if I'm dealing with Publix or I'm dealing with a Kroger, or I'm dealing with Albert the Safeway, I'm dealing with one buyer. So I'm dealing with someone who's usually in the industry for you know 20, 30 years, very set in their ways. Um, I'm operating the space, so my frozen bakery products are frozen bread, sometimes frozen breakfast, depending on the retailer. Um, a lot of older legacy players, they've known, um, they've known their, in this case, the vendor of my, like, my, my competition, they've known them for years. So it's, uh, the, the, the challenge has been developing a relationship with the buyers such that they trust me to provide solutions for them. So one of the solutions I provided was, hey, your space is pretty stagnant. You have, you know, um, it's frozen bread. It's not a sexy space. No one gives a damn about frozen bread. But the thing is, a lot of people buy it, but there's not a lot of innovations happening in the space. And I was like, well, I can bring more, I can bring new shoppers to the space. I can bring more feet to the market for them. You know, that's at the end of the day, what the buyers care about is making sure that their category, whether it's the frozen bread category, frozen breakfast category, they want their category to, uh, they want every single slot in that their category to make money for them. And if the product is not moving, if it's not rotating, then that is a, a lost opportunity for them. So I have to come in with the solution and I have to build that trust with the buyer that I can actually provide that solution for them. So that's always, and that is an ongoing challenge because again, you're dealing with personalities and every buyer is very different in how they approach. Some are super just data-driven and all you need to do is give them the numbers and you're good to go. Some are soup like they want to talk about family, they want to talk about relationships, they want to talk, they want to talk to you as a friend, like, but you have to read the room. And you have to understand like what you're walking into and know that the first conversation is not going to get you the yes. It's the third, the fourth, the fifth conversation that will get you the yes. Yeah. 
That's a super important skill to learn to be able to interact with a lot of different kinds of people. Yeah, it's uh, something that I will admit was not um, a strong suit for the longest time. I've actually worked with professionals to make it better because it is a skill set. It's not, you know, some people, are, if for some people it's inherent, some people it's not, but like any other skill, like you have to practice it to, to make it work. Some great advice um, for all of our skills, our pillars and any other skills um, use. So getting into your role a little bit more. So can you tell me about your experience, not necessarily as someone who was there from the very beginning, as you said, you're not the founder of Mason Dixie Foods, but you were there um, a year after they were founded during that transition. So what was your experience like going into like the early stages? Well, for the first few years, um, and usually like if I'm doing a, a, a lecture or something, I have like a few slides, but during the first few years, no salary, um, wearing many hats, I made the product, I distributed the product, I sold the product, I did the, uh, the, the planning, I would do the demand planning, I processed the orders, I was doing it to end, I was, you know, my business partner while she's out there fundraising and building out the brand, I'm doing QuickBooks, I'm balancing the books, I'm figuring out the cash flow statements, you know, we're, you know, um, you, you have to, you have to be everything because you don't have the luxury of not being everything. Um, but when you learn how to do every single aspect of the business, it helps you figure out where your gaps are and hire the talent that you need to do um, whatever it is better. Um, one of my running mantras is, I know enough to be dangerous, but I don't know enough to do everyone's job efficiently. I can do everyone's job, but not as well as they can, which is exactly why I hire them. So, um, and I mean, th those challenges still continue today. The um, biggest challenge I continue to face is finding the talent that I need to continue to grow. Um, there, there's a mantra, it's like hire, slow, buy, or fast. Um, I wish I even have not, like, I wish I could follow that because, you know, it'd be nice to be in a position where you can hire slow and be very cognizant about who you bring on. But, you know, sometimes you don't have the luxury of time. So, you, you know, you, you hire for specific skill sets when the opportunity arises, whether or not it's, Maybe a long, a long time ago. I have made that mistake multiple times, um, but you know that's that's the nature of the labor industry too right now. It's just uh, talent is hard to come by because people have a lot of options. Um, so you gotta you, know, you gotta take you gotta take what you can. Seems like you've come a little. Um, I wouldn't say a long way from there, but you're um, always still growing. But as your team has grown, what are some of the challenges that you have with scaling your business overall? Um, so, well, one, I said, uh, finding the talent. Two, and I was talking with, um, I think, Anthony about this. One of our biggest challenges is, like, we have some people that work in Baltimore. We have some that are hybrid. We have some that are completely remote. And a lot of them came from bigger CPG companies. I can't match the benefits of bigger CPG companies that I provide. I am, you know. Uh, the healthcare opportunities that you're going to have at a firm with a thousand plus employees, I'm never going to get that much. Um, you know, salary expectations, maybe, maybe not, depends. Um, but the, ch the challenge is like imparting that culture when you have team members that are physically here and then team members that like you see once a quarter. Um, and you don't want people to become siloed. You don't want people to. Uh, you, know, you, you, you don't want animosity amongst those who are at headquarters versus those who are completely remote. Um, you want everyone to have the same cultural experience. So the challenge that we're facing, and I have no answer for it, is the fact that like, how do you make everyone feel like they're part of the same team when some of them, well, like, like I said, a third are rarely there, another third is effectively hybrid, and a third is in the office sector. I, I don't have any answer for that. And that's like something we continue, my business partner and I continue to try to figure out solutions for. Unfortunately, that seems like a challenge a lot of companies are facing these days with that hybrid model. Yeah, no, it, it is too. And like when we hire like at the director level and above, like we're hiring uh, this like 
you know, they're, they're usually vetted because they come from another CPG company, but the junior staff, like the ones that are a few years out of college, you know, they're, um, they're the ones that need the, the, the in-person experience the most because that's how you, you develop a career. You, you're going to overhear things just in the office. There's opportunities that are going to rise because the CFO is just, you know, mentioning, you know, um, a, a, you know a, a problem that arose with, uh, you know, reporting to the bank or something like that. Like there's, there are, there are professional, um, there are, prof there are professional um, opportunities that don't arise from it. And that's just the nature of it. Yeah. Um, so shifting a little bit, you mentioned that you worked for the Square in Malawi and also some large corporations like Booz Allen and KPMG. Mm -hmm. What are some of the differences you've noticed in how these businesses operate in different locations and different types? Okay, well, I would have replaced, like, okay, so my experience with Booz Allen and KPMG was imperative because it helped me make a deck so well that I could, like, talk to investors and communicate um, exactly what an investor is looking for. Like, I was client facing at both of those firms, so I knew how to speak to my client, my customer, um, and, you know, synthesize a lot of data into very specific points. Um, in Malawi, you know, like I said, I work with small scale entrepreneurs. It was fantastic. The biggest hurdle, and this is a hurdle that every entrepreneur has just in different scale is access to capital. Like that was, that was always the issue. Um, you know, in Malawi, you know, a few hundred dollars in capital goes a long way, um, especially for these small, very small enterprises in the village, you know, for, you know, in, in in food manufacturing, you're usually talking about, you know, anywhere from a few hundred thousand to a few million dollars to, to get started. But it's the same problem, it's just a different scale than where you're at. It's access to capital. A pretty common problem for a lot of entrepreneurs. Yeah, it's like <laughs> the problem. Yeah. All right. Um, just one more question for me before we get into our QA then. So on your website, it mentions that you are champions of uniqueness. So what do you do to cultivate that uniqueness? your team and your ideas just in the company. I mean, so that goes back to imparting that culture. So, you know, we take pride in the fact that we're a woman-owned, minority-owned business. Um, we operate in the frozen, frozen bread space, the frozen breakfast space, you know, with a lot of legacy players that talk about their product, but not about who they are. So we always like to talk about who we are as space and Dickie Foods, who we are as people. And we, we hire from wherever and like wherever the, the, the candidate comes from, um, you know, the best talent we've had have been referrals from people that are already working for us. Um, they're already vetted. So um, we don't set out to have, we don't have diversity quotas. We don't have, you know, any of those, uh, we, we don't have metrics that we like to follow, but it just, it just happens because we talk about who we are every single day as it seems like that's really working for you, that diversity is just happening and it's benefiting. And yeah, it's like, it creates that gravitational pull where like, you know, you just get uh, more and more. I mean, outside of, I'm the only male exec, but the rest of the exec team, the other seven, are, it's all it's all women, um, which we, we take pride in too, because a lot of them came from larger firms because, you know, they maybe felt that they didn't have necessarily the advancement opportunities or, um, the um, access to opportunities that other people had. Um, but, you know, those firms lost, it's my, it's my game, it's Asha's game. It's like we, we're bringing on the talent regardless of who they are, who they love, what they look like, et cetera, et cetera. You know. All right, well, I think we're in a great place to start our Q&A. So if you're here in the hub, feel free to raise your hand, um, introduce yourself, ask your question. If you're on Zoom, you can also raise your hand and. Um, or send a question in the chat and we will ask. If you guys have questions on frozen logistics and supply chain, I'm happy to talk about that for hours. That's really the bread and butter. You can talk warehousing if you want to. Kind of more people question. Sure. That was based on uh, what you just said about some of the challenges with your team being in different places, different modalities. Uh, and you said you're working, you're working on that. And so I was curious about like, what is your process for 
for like trying to solve tricky problems that are, uh, you know, they're resistant maybe to some of the traditional ways of solving them. Like, what is your approach to try to like get to that place where things are better? It's very iterative. So we do bring everyone once a quarter together, um, just like physically together. So everyone can meet each other. Um, we do um, family meal. So this goes back to like our restaurant roots. So like when you have a restaurant, you know, usually you have what's called family meal right before service starts. It's just like stuff that's gonna go bad. You put it together or whatever. Um, every other Thursday we do what's family meal at the office, um, usually some theme and we bring whoever's there to um, my business partner. Like she, her, her building has like a party room. We bring everyone together. So everyone can interact without being in the office because it's very important to, to, to build those relationships. Um, we spray every, it's, I know like for some people they roll their eyes. I was rolling my eyes for years, but I, I finally come around to it. But we celebrate everyone's birthday um, with like uh, the call outs and stuff like that. Like it's those little things just to help people like realize they're, they're recognized. Um, but, you know, it is like, I don't think it's a fancy ever. I think it doesn't like, you're still at the end of the day dealing with different personalities. You have people that have been with me for several years. They've, they've seen their roles evolve as well. People become territorial, like that's just the nature of work. You have people that are just new to the team. So, you know, you got, you know, turf issues. You got, like, you're dealing with personality. So there's no one solution there, you know, and there will be missteps. There have to be missteps. So, yeah, we don't know. Yeah, that's honest. I appreciate that. Yeah, we. Yeah, so. Um, you talked about how the future company is still in the change phase. So, how do you plan on taking it from the teenage? Um, how do I plan to get it from the teenage phase to the mature phase? Well, one, I need to survive the teenage years. So, the target, like especially for our competitors, so like they're very big players in the space. They now recognize us. Um, so the target's on our back. So um, whether it's, um, you know, uh, territorial fights in the grocery stores, space, like slotting out allocations on the shelves, um, pushes into um, our, our breakfast program with some of our, our food service partners. Um, I need to survive the teenage years. Um, so, you know, for the first five or six years of this business, you know, the, the biggest crux is like, are we going to survive? You know, you know, we didn't know. Um, you know, we were growing, but, you know, it was like, you know, all it could take is just a, a few a few punches thrown and we'd be, we'd be out. We'd be out. Um, now our immediate survival is not, not in question at all. But we need to think strategically, like for the next, you know, four or five years down the road. And does that mean building my own manufacturing facility, not working with partners? Maybe does it mean my own building my own packaging facility, not working with packaging partners? Maybe does it mean like starting to control the the trucking space as opposed to doing consolidated? Does it mean like you know diversifying what channels I'm operating in? Probably does it mean like moving out of just frozen and into ambient space, or perhaps like you know, the, the question isn't my immediate survival, it's my survival in the next four or five years. I get through that hurdle, then, you know, then I guess, I, I don't know. Well, I, I even know what it means to be a mature business. Like, I really don't know what that means. Because it's like, does that mean you're wearing a suit and tie? Does that mean you have 100 employees? Does that mean you just did $200 million of revenue? Does that mean you have three, like, three headquarters, like, one headquarters and two other offices? Uh, it'll be one of those things where you just wake up and realize, like, oh, uh, you're now one of the big boys and not just one of the, the small kids in town. That's not an answer, but it is an answer, I guess. Yeah, it's a realistic one. Yeah. Uh, so how do you think about pricing your products, especially when working with, like, these larger customers, such as the Publix or Kroger's? And how has that changed since uh, we first started? So our product line... We know it's made with real ingredients. So we know we'll never be able to compete on price with our core competitors because 
they don't use really pre-mixed. They use additives and stuff like that, which just makes the product inherently cheaper. Um, so even with the buyer, we tell them like, we're we're an upmarket product for an upmarket consumer. We're not gonna be everything to everyone. And if you try to be everything to everyone, like you're gonna get yourself into a, a terrible situation. Um, but you know, you also have margin expectations for, for your, you have, you're like, I need X points of margin when it hits the shelf because I need to cover my overhead, I need to cover promotions, I need to cover X, Y, Z. And then once you know what the margin is, you know what your, you know, let's, but we'll take this one first now because it's not like it's, it's super new. Um, so our biscuits retail and the conventional retailer for uh, anywhere from $4.99 to $5.99, depending on what margin retailer is making, um, as well as the distribution method. Our competitors usually do anywhere from $2.99 to $3.49, maybe $3.99 if it's like a, a specific count. So I'm always going to be like a dollar to a dollar fifty more than my, my competitors. Like that, that will that will change. Um, but what does change is like how do I uh, you know approach uh, the the promotional activity? Do I do more dollar offs? Do I do what's called trade spend? Do I get, you know, do I steal market share from my competitors or do I add more shoppers to the space and just take those shoppers who are less price sensitive? Um, the pricing strategy, to answer your question, can kind of run it that way. The pricing strategy depends on the retailer and depends on the consumer of the retailer. Um, if I'm going, like, we're in Whole Foods, Whole Foods is not, the consumer is not price sensitive. So, like, that's not, you know, when I do the, the pricing strategy there, like, I'm not concerned about the end price so much as I am about the merchandising. Kroger, price sensitive. Sam's Club, very price sensitive. So I'm I'm taking a margin hit, you know, and you know I'm increasing my minimum order so that way my freight cost per case is less. You know, it the you know, we can talk about like you know pricing theory all day long, but it really depends on the customer and what my my goal is. Target. Target's a fantastic for brand building. A lot of consumers, like they have grocery, but grocery doesn't make, like there's not a lot of grocery activity in Target actually. Um, so I look at that as a brand opportunity. I don't really look at it as like really helping top line or bottom line. Um, you know, Kroger goes through a lot of volume. Sam's Club goes through a lot more volume. So, you know, maybe I can take a margin hit on something with a lot of volume because, you know, I'll make it up, you know, I'll make it up. So it really, really just depends on what the retailer is and what the strategy is. So again, an answer, but not really an answer. Yeah. Um, so I have a question. You mentioned supply chains. How has that been affected by the pandemic? Everything, like every step of the way from butter, inputs, freight, labor, line time. Um, I mean, I'll say something that has like everyone's been saying since it started, like just in time inventory management, but that's out the window. That is not coming back. Um, you have to build a buffer for every single step of the way. Um, so that means you're holding inventory, you're holding components, you're holding ingredients because you have to secure that before, like otherwise, like you can't plan production, you know. Like uh, every every day it's a battle for for time, for allocation of space, for um, you know, uh, especially during Q4 last year, I mean, trucks are just freight, frozen trucks are just going to the highest bidder, like at that point. So like your, your freight models, your cost models are just out the door. It's like, so, you know, you're going to spend maybe 50 cents more per case for, to get your shipment there, but then, so that's the cost, but then, you know, if you don't do it, then your shelf is empty at the store. So the competitor just took your space. So now you definitely lost sales for like the next few months while you try to fight for that space back. Like it's just, it's, it's, you're rewriting the playbook in real time and along every step of the way. It's just a question like, I'm, I'm obviously not in the food space. Uh, and not the brand. But you could be. I could, I could be. Yeah, we're hiring. <laughs> um, what is anything, what are any interesting trends that you're paying attention to in the in the bread sector or in the breakfast sector? Uh, like, I mean, we just focus on making products with real ingredients, like the gluten-free stuff, the, 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 all those call-outs, those are just, 
there are trends that I don't, I mean, you look at the data, it's a flip, it's a flip space, you know? And then the thing is like, especially like in, in the food space, like a call out will um, kind of gain traction and, you know, it'll kind of go into this echo chamber where everyone says it, but the consumer isn't actually going to get Yeah, no, so like we, we really don't follow um, trends. We just go after making products that are already there. We just make them better, cleaner, like the, just real, real ingredients. Yeah. So the real ingredient component, like that's, yeah. you would consider that apart from a trend like gluten-free or like any of those other. Yeah. Products. Like we'll never do plant-based meat because that goes against uh, being, you know, having real ingredients like plant-based meats, pea proteins and additives and soy additives. I'm like, it's literally the opposite of our ethos. We'll never do gluten free because to do gluten free, you have to do several different kinds of flours and you have to replace the gluten protein to get that biscuit structure that you need. So, it, like, it goes against our basic ethos is real food with real ingredients. That's literally what we focus on, um, which is why I was mentioning will we go get out of the frozen space? I mean, we, we might go into other categories, like, but you know, like, as long as we're always making real food with real ingredients, that's like, that's, that's our mission. Yeah. Since you sort of have a buffer between um, Mason and Dixie and like the end person who's actually eating the food, how do you sort of think about getting really good insights on them? That is actually a really good question because we don't even really do BTC because as a frozen product, BTC is like way too expensive. So the, like the end consumer is like, if they ordered stuff, I mean, we have D to C on, on our website, but it, it's, it's really for marketing purposes. It's like, I would never suggest find something frozen, like having that shit to you because it's just, it's it's one, bad for the planet and two, it's just really expensive. Um, how to get insights, there's a lot in the, from, in the food space, there's actually several different companies where you can get um, uh, a, like retailer insights. So like you can see trends on the retailer level, um, you can see trends um, on the consumer side, you can see like what categories are Forming with which ones are you can buy that data for actual consumer feedback that we get we, it comes to us via email social media and we have real people at the other side answering them as real people there we don't have scripts for any of our responses like you like one of our one of our standards is you respond to the customer as the person like they are a person you talk to them like a person um so that's where we glean our insights from like like it's not sophisticated, you know, and obviously like it's only the loud voices that we hear, but that's really like the only way, especially during COVID. Pre-COVID, we used to do a lot of demos in stores. So we'd actually be giving the product out, talking to people who, who do buy product, you know. Um, but you know, with when COVID happened, like obviously a lot of store demos, like those programs shut down, so we can't do that. But um, to answer your question from our end user, we get that feedback from social media emails, um, whatever platform they, you know, our consumers tend to, to use now. So um, yeah, but it's again, just not the right stuff here. So yeah. So you mentioned a lot of, uh, a lot of respectable strategies that Mason Dixie used. I'm just curious which one gives uh, the company and your employees the most confidence to go up against the legacy food manufacturers? Of uh, like the, the data insights? Or like, like, or like, just as a company itself, because uh, like the strategies like uh, minority-owned business, fresh food. Uh, you just mentioned something that I completely forgot, but just like, okay, um, I, yeah. So our strength is the fact that we're agile, and so when we talk to Marriott or we talk to Uber, we talk to any of our buyers, and they want a solution. Because remember, like my 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 crux is I can provide. That solution to your problem. You just need to tell me what your problem is. We're an agile company, so we can make that solution pretty damn fast. Whereas our legacy players, they, for better or for worse, like they have, like anytime they have an innovation, it's in years to get to market. I can do it in months. Is it painful? Yes. Does it cause a lot of pressure for my team? Absolutely. But like, I'm not going to say no to an opportunity, neither would they, you know, because that's the, it's for everyone's benefit. Um, and I don't want to lose that agility, but it's also balancing it with like the need for internally for stability because people can only run at 110% or so long before they get burned out. And I see that too. And 
and I don't want to lose talent to burn out. So um, our strength right now is our agility. Do you have anything online? I don't, I don't know how this. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. Yeah. What's up? Uh, so for the business to grow, let's say 10x or 100x, what, yeah. Yeah. what what would the infrastructure have to look like at that level? How would it sort of change, um, especially maybe on the supply chain and logistics side? Okay. Well, do you want to do 10x or 100x? Because like those are two very different. Let's do both. Okay, for 10x, um, I can probably, I probably need to bring on one or two, maybe three more partners on the co manufacturing, co packing side, um, and probably need to do, I, I, we could do that with our current product line, bringing on two large, two more large group service customers and bringing in more capacity on the co manufacturing side, co packing side. 100x, I definitely need my own facilities. Um, and we would literally have to be, we'd have to, we would have to be in the frozen space and in additional spaces as well to, to make that happen, which you know, all of our all of our experience as a CPG company is in frozen. So like basically we have a whole nother team that knows the ambient space or refrigerated space. Um, you know, and yeah, that's scary. Yeah, hundred hundred X on yeah, hundred X puts us, yeah, that's 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 nesting territory. Yeah. Do yeah. you think there would be any challenges with reaching a hundred times oh, scale absolutely. with maintaining your brand mm. Um no, not losing the ethos, but losing the culture. Like that's always gonna be a struggle. And Asha and I talk about all the time. It's like um I mean, even as from startup to teenage, we've had to change some of the things how we do things like we you know to be completely frank you know for the first few years of our business we were in we work like when we work was still a thing it's kind of a thing but not really a thing um and we there was four of us and effectively 100 square feet we have very passionate loud shouting matches calling each other names that i'm not going to say on like repeat but the thing is like we did it because we had everything riding on um, we can't do that anymore because it becomes, it can be a liability. Um, so we're losing some of the, what made us like, what made us scrappy, what made us like kind of like personable, it, you start to lose that as, as you grow. So it's like, how do you continue to improve that? I don't know. Um, you know, when you get to, uh, when you get to TEDx, like you'll, you know, at that point, you'll probably have legal in-house, you know, you will have definitely HR. Um, at that point right now, like we have, I mean, I'm, I'm an HR with an outsource HR of, of ombudsman, like as needed, but you know, when you're 10X, you have to have that real corporate infrastructure. When you're hundred X, like you definitely don't know all your employees. Like that's right. Like at least now I know, I still know everyone. I know their spouses and you know, some of their kids, I don't know all their kids, but yeah. Yeah, that's always a struggle. Um, well, that's all the questions we have for today. Thank you so much for dedicating your time with us today and giving us your insights on your journey. No, it's a pleasure. And again, if you have questions about frozen distribution, I would like, I can talk about that for, for hours, for days, for days. Yeah. But yeah, thank you. Chris, thank you so much for being here. Um, we do have some pizza that just got delivered, so please feel free to um, come in here. Um, if everyone could stay for just a couple minutes, though, everyone on Zoom as well. Um, just a few final things before we wrap up. We're going to put the QR code up here again to check in if you didn't get a chance to do so at the beginning. Just to let us know you're here, whether you're a student or not, or a member or not, we still would like to know. Um, and you can earn points for being here that you can redeem for swag, like um, shirts, sweatshirts, tumblers, hats, chick flag gift certificates, and more. And there's swag over there, too, for those in person. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm not leaving with it. So, um, and also on the next slide, we'll be putting up. You can leave us feedback to help us improve our events. We really want to make our events the best they can be for you. So your voice is really invaluable to us. And you can also earn points by doing that survey. Um, both of these links will be sent in the chat as well if you cannot use the QR code. 
And lastly, just a heads up about some upcoming events here at the Entrepreneurship Center. We'll be having our next AFS in two weeks on April 28th. And tomorrow we'll be having our regular rocket pitch at 2 p.m. And next Wednesday, um, actually not this one, the week after that, um, April 27th, we'll be having a community hangout. That is it. We'll be putting up a few QR codes up here. Um, also glad to become a member if you're not, but thank you so much for being here, everyone. Thank you. Oh, I didn't invite two. They were actually there. You go. Yeah, so Thank you. Uh, oh, I know it was like kind of like ambling around. Yeah. Like, I'm like, just, you know, grab yeah. a slice. Yeah. 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 No, that's, that's the, a more uh, approachable style for sure. Yeah. Well, yeah, thanks for the questions. Oh, yeah. yeah. For sure. The, um, the real food uh, ethos. Yeah. Real food with real ingredients. Real yeah. food with real ingredients. It reminds me of a, so before I came here, I was at a venture capital firm in Richmond to help start. Oh, thank you for some ventures. I know, I saw him. Yeah. So did you mark with, um, <laughs> oh my God, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 yeah, 